And the main thing you want to avoid, you do not want to hire the wrong person because that is the most expensive mistake you can possibly make. It's really expensive in money and in time and in lost opportunity. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the High Level Spotlight Sessions, where we showcase awesome marketers doing awesome marketing. Today, I'm joined by Noel Andrews. He is the owner of JobRack, which is a platform where businesses can hire remote talent from Eastern Europe. Noel, thanks for so much for coming on. Hey, no worries, Chase. Great to be here. I'm super excited to chat with you. Um, I was really excited to do this spotlight because um, I have built a team with many folks uh, remotely from Eastern Europe. And I absolutely loved all of them. And so I was happy to shine some love on the region and job rack in general. Yeah, thanks, man. It's uh, it, Lots of people are discovering it. It's kind of been a well-kept secret for quite a while. And uh, yeah, definitely trying to tell a few more people about it. So why is that? And how did you, what led to job rack? I'm assuming you were hiring remote people in Eastern Europe and it went from there. Yeah. So kind of, so I actually bought job rack uh, back in 2018. Oh, wow. So job rack was founded uh, through a forum post uh, in a community called the dynamite circle. Uh, and mm. two guys uh, independently had been hiring and had been hiring developers from Eastern Europe. You know, they had all the same challenges that so many other business owners go through, you know, uh, kind of can't afford to hire locally in the US, UK, Canada, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, they've tried some of the other regions of the world where, you know, you can get really low cost, but often that comes with low quality or some kind of cultural challenges and differences. And then they kind of stumbled across Eastern Europe. Um, and so independently, they were hiring from there. And then there were some threads in, the, in this forum. And they were kind of both thinking about starting up a job board. And then they were like, hey, we should, we should have a chat. Uh, and they did. And then JobRack was born. And they kind of built the tech stack out, ran it for a few years. But they always had bigger kind of main projects going on. It was kind of a bit of a side hustle. Um, and so there was a point that came. It had been kind of moderately successful. Um, but they didn't have the, the time or attention to, to really kind of drive it. And it was either going to get shut down or sold. Um, I'd been doing a lot in the kind of remote hiring space, in the consultancy space, helping business owners kind of find good people and how to go about it. And it was just literally kind of serendipity. Uh, it was just like, hey, here's a, a business that's already got a little bit of traction, a tiny bit of traction. It was very, very tiny when I bought it. Um, but it was niched right down. And Eastern Europe is just this absolute kind of sweet spot of remote hiring. And um, yeah, it kind of jumped right in. And it's been an exciting ride. I'm about just over three years in now. It's been, uh, it's been an exciting ride so far. Very cool. Well, a lot of our community members <clears throat> are uh, early agency entrepreneurs that are, you know, at the point where they need to start growing the team if they want to get past the 10k month barrier, past 20k a month, and so um, I think this chat will be really helpful for them. Mm -hmm. So I would love to talk about, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the stereotypics of um, mm -hmm. people from specific regions, but you know, a lot of people's first thought, oh, if I'm going to hire remotely, is I'm going to go to the Philippines. And so why, talk to me about how the Philippines has become the immediate thought versus Eastern Europe or other areas. Uh, why is that in your opinion? So I think I'll, I'll preface it by saying you can hire amazing people from anywhere in the world, right? They of do course. exist. And, you know, and what we tend to find is that, you know, we have a lot of people that come to, to kind of job rack to hire from us and hire from Eastern Europe because of certain experiences that they have that you can very cautiously make some kind of almost kind of cultural stereotypes. Um, but again, prefacing it by saying you know, there's amazing people all over the world. So the rise of the Philippines for me, you know, some from the U.S. side of things, um, big, big companies were looking for 24 seven call center operations. And so they needed people with really good English skills with low cost that was kind of relatively time zone compatible. Um, and, you know, some kind of uh, smart people were setting up big call center operations in the Philippines that were kind of catering to that market. So lots of big organizations kind of outsourced out to the Philippines. Um, then that's led on to, you know, some entrepreneurs with the kind of they're going, well, hey, there's there's opportunity for us to kind of, you know, provide virtual assistance and, and things like that. So, you know, Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. Um, Chris Ducker, Mad Singers, many others kind of in that in that kind of space, um, providing really, really great people to kind of do tasks, right, particularly. And there's, you know, there's some fantastic sites uh, like onlinejobs.ph, right? You can advertise a job there. You advertise a virtual assistant job there. You're going to get 300 applicants in 24 hours. Um, lots of good people. 
Um, there's a certain amount of pain that comes with getting 300 job applicants. That's not necessarily what you what you want. Um, sure. But yeah, you know, it's very, very low cost. You know, a few years ago, you could be getting a virtual assistant, at, you know, three bucks an hour who you know could do a good job of just kind of doing kind of straightforward tasks. And if you found that the needle in the haystack, potentially a lot more than that. And there are some really great people um, culturally. So I think that's why kind of it, it rose up quite so much. And still continues to do really, really well for many people. Um, I think the cultural challenge is around um, a little bit around kind of almost subservience and, you know, the kind of the authority piece. So you will have to work very, very hard to find someone in the Philippines that will challenge you as the boss mm. and that will tell you that you're wrong or that you might have made a mistake or that there's a better way of doing it. And so amazing at following SOPs and doing tasks, et cetera, and you get broad kind of generalization. But if you want people to really be kind of looking at things going, right, how can I make this better? How can I kind of challenge the boss, et cetera? That's, that's a lot harder to find. That's not a kind of uh, cultural norm out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, we also hired um, several people from the Philippines. And I think I can definitely relate to that. Um, another again, stereotypically speaking, but was true in, in my experience was um, communication. Oftentimes, if somebody needed time off, they were afraid to ask for mm. it. And so they would just disappear. And yeah. so we came to experience several um, full-time VAs that we had worked with for years in the Philippines would often disappear for a few days at a time. Mm. And we just kind of came to deal with it right it was just you know and we would talk about it afterwards like hey there's no need to do that like we're we're so happy to have you back like is something wrong you know da, da, da. no nothing da, da, da. and then you know it would happen again and uh and and so that seemed to be uh true in my experience with folks from um, the philippines but at the same time it was worth it for us because again there are some incredibly talented folks over mm -hmm. there and and that it worked for us like it was the benefits outweighed the downside but that was definitely something that was every time it happened was always interesting and kind of shocking and like scratching my head of like i thought we talked about this um, yeah. but it seems to continually happen which is something that um, i never had experience with the folks that we worked with from from eastern europe so let's talk about some of the stereotypical um pros of folks in other regions like the eastern uh, european area yeah so i think i mean eastern europe has this like i said i kind of refer to it as the sweet spot so they have a really really strong education system especially around kind of technical subjects so it's you know it's renowned for incredible software developers and software engineers things like that um they've also had a, a pretty rough time of it right you go back kind of 20 years or so when kind of i was growing up and you know this region of the world was on the news because it, they were at war right you know yeah. real proper war um and so and in many areas they're still recovering from that you know certainly economically um mm -hmm. you know there were lots of people displaced lots of people losing homes families all kinds of things and so they've known real hardship right in a way that us uh, entitled folks in the western world have not and probably will not ever really truly experience and so what comes from that is a just a work ethic that is just like unreal right people that really really want to work hard um want to have a better life want to earn more money um, and want stability. And that is something that's you know, really great for us. So at JobRack, we focus on helping people hire long-term team members. Might be part-time, might be full-time, um, but people that want to commit and you know, do a great job and really help a business owner to, to grow their business. And so that, it kind of drives this really kind of lovely, lovely kind of combination. So incredible work ethic, really great English skills, um, you know, great technical education, and, you know, these countries generally have a pretty low cost of living, certainly compared to, you know, US, UK, Western mm. Europe, etc. Um, and so, you know, a typical kind of rate for a software developer might be kind of 40 or 50 percent of what you'd be paying in, you know, in California, Seattle, New York, etc. or London. Um, and yet the quality will often be better. You know, they're going to work harder. They're more committed. They want to kind of learn better skills. Um, they don't have that kind of same sense of expectation or entitlement that, you know, is so much more common over here. Um, so it's, but at the same it's, time, I, I would add to that, and from my personal experience, all of that is absolutely true. We hired, um, we had several designers, developers, SEO folks, very technically, um, really amazing people, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, like super talented folks 
who were um, clearly trained very well. Several of them would speak at their university that they had graduated from, uh, things like that. And the opposite of the stereotype we talked about um, of not wanting to challenge your boss, very much, I would say, passionately driven, right? Not like arrogance, but more like, hey, I'm really passionate about this. And so I really want to help push everything forward. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of often, I have to warn people about it, especially, you know, soft mannered, like kind of people from the US or the UK, like direct communication. It's like nothing you've ever experienced before. Yeah. And at first it's like, it can be a it's not brutal. It can be blunt. It, and I'm, I'm a pretty blunt person. I often apologize for it in advance and, you know, I can, I can take it as well as I can give it, but with Eastern Europe, it, yeah, it's very direct communication style and it, it's quite deadpan, right? So they'll, if you've said something they think is wrong, they might just say, no, that is wrong. Yeah. And you're like, you're like, what? And, and it's literally like that. And you're kind of like, did I hear that just right? And then you get used to it and you're like, oh my God, I never want to have a a soft fluffy conversation ever again just give it to me direct give it to me straight and it is it's brilliant and that is a, a huge huge win um and still you know i encourage that within my team but the fact that it's a kind of a cultural norm makes a, a big difference mm. um so that's a big thing we've also got the fact that they have no extreme weather right eastern mm. europe is a very very stable um place from that perspective they've got incredible internet connections, you know, better internet connections than you know, I have here in the UK uh, for similar cost, And in fact, sometimes lower, um, which is great. And one interesting, just coming back to the anecdote you mentioned about like kind of the Philippines where, like you said, you've got, there's two things that kick in around kind of people just disappearing on you. Right. Mm. One is the fact that they um, feel bad, right. Or they don't feel they can ask for the leave. And two is that, I don't know, have you ever heard of the whole thing about how kind of Filipino VAs, their grandparents die six times a year. <laughs> It is. And, and it's, it's a really like common kind of comment you hear. And at first you think, well, they must just be taking the mick, right? Because you can only, it's difficult to have six grandparents, right? Or uh, actual, you know, kind of blood relatives. Sure. Then, you, then you get into their society and their community and you realize how they live. And they live in a very extended community. So they have lots of aunts and uncles, as it were, right? Mm. And these are like family. So when, you know, if someone does pass away or if someone is ill, the community and the, the extended family all rally around. Nothing is more important. Um, not you, not your business, not their job, nothing. And that is why they will kind of often disappear because mm. family comes first. Mm. And I don't disagree with that, but that's where this kind of whole thing comes from, how they can disappear multiple times a year because of this, mm. you know, it's a very extended family. And like but you, you said, also mentioned... Effort, you also, sorry to cut you off. You also mentioned uh, weather, which might've sounded like what weather, but in the yeah. Philippines area, they get hit all the time with really um, terrible storms. And so yeah. a lot of times people go dark because they had no electricity for two or three days yeah. and they literally yeah. can't tell you what's going on, um, yeah. which, which is also a very real concern to think about if you're you know relying on people in that region of the world. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the typhoons that they get out there are yeah. you know, absolutely huge. And it's certainly better in, you know, if you're in the capital city and kind of the major cities, you know, Davao, um, Manila, et cetera, then things are better, but they still get hit with it. And so it is a consideration. And that, like I said, kind of always preface it, you know, people have great success there. But there's certain things for me as a business owner, I don't want to worry about. Right. There's things that kind of like, I just want to be able to run my business, hire my team and not think about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, kind of that's what kind of attracted me to job wreck in the first place in Eastern Europe, because it's like, hang on a minute. So there's maybe a 15 percent premium over hiring, hiring from the Philippines, but with a lot of benefits and a lot of the time, the time zone is more compatible, things like that. So you that's know, what I was going to ask you next. Let's yeah. talk about time zone, because mm -hmm. it is a big difference between those two regions. Yeah. So we get typically so uh, Eastern Europe will be what will they be kind of minus or kind of plus six hours from East Coast, five or six hours, depending where you are. Um, and plus about eight hours from West Coast. So we have people, you know, we always look, most roles, uh, we're always looking for a crossover about four hours or so. If you've got three to four hours crossover with someone, that is generally more than enough to do kind of, you know, team meetings, you know, async, and the rest can be asynchronous communication. Um, it's a bit harder if they've got to be doing, you know, kind of real-time communication with customers that's going to go into the evenings, things like that. And that's where I'll always say to people, look, hang on, this might not be a fit because I'm not a big fan of trying to hire people to work night shifts and overnight. That is something that Philippines is great for, and it's really common. From a human perspective, I'm a little bit anti it because I just don't think it's that healthy long-term. 
And I don't think it's that sustainable long term. And so I always push back. So, you know, business owners will come to me and say, hey, I want someone to work East Coast hours. And I'm like, well, that means they're going to work from 4 p.m. till midnight in Eastern Europe, five nights a week. Yeah, that's not great, right? They can't have a hobby. They can't go out and play soccer, go to the cinema, things like that. Do you really need it? And if they do really need it, then I'll often help them and guide them and say, look, maybe this isn't the right place for you. I do have some clients that have you know, teams of people through us that do work those hours. But there's a danger around how long term sustainable that is, especially as you know, you've got to be really special to get someone to want to work till midnight every night of the week for you. And just offering a remote job, that's no longer very special. There's a lot of those around right now. Yeah, I was really going to echo that same point again from personal experience. I, if you go to the Philippines and you're, um, you have a competitive uh, pay, you'll find people thinking they can do it, committing to it, and then trying to work this inverted natural schedule where they're vampires, you know, it just kills you from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and it, in the several times we tried to have somebody run one of those schedules after a couple of months, it just blew up. Right. And again, they, they disappeared on us and you could see the signs leading up to it. It's just not healthy for somebody to, yeah. to live like that. And so, um, whereas when we worked with, when we hired folks in Croatia, which is where um, a lot of our team was, like you said, we had a couple hours a day of crossover. So it was perfect for the communication that we needed to do. It was um, cool because you'd, you'd start your day and you'd, a lot of work would already be done, ready for you to review. Um, and you'd have plenty of time to review it before they were gonna finish their day. And so it was a really nice schedule. It worked out very well for us. We were on East Coast time, so it worked very um, well for us working with folks in that region. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a real, you know, that kind of, like you said, waking up and finding that half a day's work's been done is, is awesome. Um, and if you can kind of very really cool. leverage that, it works amazingly for a lot of roles. There's a couple that it doesn't, but for a lot of the time, you can really, yeah, it's just so efficient. So, so efficient. Um, so what other tips do you have? I mean, I think... We've done justice to the region. Uh, hopefully some of uh, my old teammates and colleagues see this because again, I can't um, praise them highly enough for, for the work that I got to do with them. Um, when people come to you, what else do you, do you like to preface them with? Like, hey, you know, if you're really serious about working with folks in this region, what else do they need to know? You know, getting started, what other tips do you have? Yeah. So a couple of things. So one is, you know, make sure they've got the time to hire. Right. So hiring is hard. It's, you know, I'm hiring for myself. I'm, my team's expanding significantly at the moment. And hiring is always hard. Right. Even when I've got a team of experts that, you know, we're driving through. So you've got to be committed to doing it. Right. You've got to have the time to do it and, you know, kind of the expertise or the knowledge. We see a lot of people kind of fumble their way through it and we give people a lot of help and support, whether they're doing a $199 job post on the job board or whether they're working with us, with us kind of doing the hiring for us, with a done with you and done for you service. Um, so the main thing is just kind of being aware and being committed to it. We see now and again, people come and they're trying to hire someone in like two days, right? And they want to put a job out. They want to get a bunch of applicants. They want to just go, yep, you, you'll do, bring them in. And I often, you know, at the top of our application forms that we use for candidates, we say at the top, hey, this is a long application form. It's going to take you 30 to 40 minutes to complete. Um, but we're about to invest 10, 20, $30,000 with you over the next year or so, right? If that's not worth 30 minutes of your time, then hey, no worries, right? You know, we're, you're not for us and we're not for you. And I say the same thing to the business owners, like, right, if they were going to go out and drop 10, 20 grand on a car or a holiday or whatever it might be, how long would they think about it? Right. And it puts in perspective, whereas sometimes when they think oh, it's a thousand dollars a month or two or three thousand dollars a month, they just don't give it that same consideration that they would as if they were handing over, you know, 30 grand or 20 grand or whatever it is to, to someone for something. So we kind of try and really make them think about that. Um, think about what you actually want and what you actually need up front. So, again, all the time we used to see people get right to the point of offering or interviewing and then going, oh, hell, hang on a minute. I, I actually realized I need something different. They'd be, they would have been inspired by the interviews they'd done and then realized that they were looking for the wrong thing. So again, a little bit of effort up front. And again, you know, I've got a full guide on the site that people can check out. And I give a lot of people help around this because if we get the, the bit up front right, the rest of it's a lot more straightforward. 
Um, and the main thing you want to avoid, you do not want to hire the wrong person because that is the most expensive mistake you can possibly make. It's really expensive in money and in time and in lost opportunity. So it kind of sounds odd, but, you know, I'm not, you know, once we get things started, we move really quick. But the main thing is if we slow down and inject a little bit of time and consideration up front, um, and if all business owners do that, it's you're off to a much, much better start. So thinking it through, being clear what you want, and then going to the right place to find the people you want, right? So, you know, there is a time and a place for massive generic job boards. I'm not a massive fan, and I know a lot of people kind of struggle to get good results from them these days. So again, you know, if you need a native English speaking content writer that's going to work West Coast hours, don't go and look on, you know, kind of foreign focused sites like JobRack or like onlinejobs.ph. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, can, you know, can't afford a, a local developer in California, for instance, then you shouldn't be looking on in, Indeed or LinkedIn in California. That's not going to hit the spot. Um, so it's finding about kind of what are the most important things to you and then finding the, you know, the area that works for you and getting advice. You know, in most of our businesses and, and a lot of your customers, Chase, that, you know, it's all about figuring out what you're good at and then getting help or outsourcing the things you're not good at. For and, sure. you know, it's often said that a CEO or a business owner's number one job is to hire great people. Right. Mm -hmm. But often what gets missed is they think that means they need to do it themselves and they need mm -hmm. to be an expert in it. And yet they're probably not doing their own SEO. They're probably not doing their own accounting or bookkeeping. They've got experts to do that. And one of the things I spend a lot of time helping people with is kind of, you know, helping them realize that, oh, hang on a minute, hiring is just the same. I need to hire great people. I just don't need to do all the painful hard work with it. Maybe we should get some help for that. And that's, yeah, that's obviously where we step in. Mm, that's great. So do you actually step in or is it just like a self-serve marketplace where you post something and sift through the responses yourself and, you know, so it used to be just out. that. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. it used to be just exactly that. So it was a very classical job board and job boards are hugely popular right now. From an investment perspective, they are, you know, Nirvana. You know, Andrew Wilkinson's doing some great things in this space with WeWork Remotely. Many other job boards out there kind of in great multiples when you come to sell them. They're wonderful. It's like money while you sleep. Um, however, a lot of them are very faceless and we wanted to put a slightly different kind of approach to it. So we wanted to help people hire and give people a lot of help. And we did that even within the, you know, the kind of DIY service. Then what we found last year, we were getting more and more people were saying, hey, look, you know, we want to hire through you guys, but we kind of want some help. We don't want to filter through the bad applicants or the mismatched applicants. We don't know how to write a really good job post. We don't know how to stand out. Um, we don't know how to filter people effectively. So can you do it for us? And initially, it was probably about six months. I was going, no, 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 look, I'll just help you for free. I'll tell you how to do it, et cetera. And then it took about probably 12 or 15 different people um, kind of asking me the same thing. And then the guy that first talked to me about it, he was like, look, I want to give you money. Just do this for me, please. Um, and that kind of launched our Done With You service where we do exactly that. So we kind of will help people figure out what they need. We will craft a job post. We know how to kind of attract the right people. And in crucially, the, one of the biggest things we do is we go out and find the candidates because a lot of the time the right candidates aren't hanging out on job boards, right? Just mm -hmm. waiting for your job post to pop up. You know, we've got a great database. We've got great kind of social reach, but sometimes we have to actually go out and headhunt them, find them on LinkedIn or other platforms like that. We're in, you know, content writing communities and kind of uh, e-commerce like operations communities, uh, Slack channels, all kinds of different places that we go to hang out where the candidates are and then attract them to, to apply for jobs. And then we do the, you know, the screening and the filtering, which is often the really painful side of things. There's nothing worse than reviewing candidates that just aren't a good fit and haven't read the job post. Um, so we do all that side of things. And we basically get people to a very tight shortlist. So I mentioned earlier on, there's job boards you can go to, you can get you know, 300 applicants within a few days. We don't play that game. We want to actually be, you know, play the opposite numbers game because no business owner that I know wants that many applicants. So with the done with you service, we're typically aiming to give like five, a short list of five people, but that we've like hand selected, screened them, spoken to them, tested them, everything, almost delivering them up with a little bow on them, ready to interview, which that's the bit that we find, yes, we can interview, but actually a business owner is always going to want to interview themselves because this sure. is about long-term team members, the right cultural fit, the right kind of skills and attitude, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we, we typically save around 40 to 60 hours of effort. Um, and act as that kind of, I use a mountain analogy a lot, like you're trying to climb a mountain. We're like the Sherpas that carry the heavy load and the mountain guide all wrapped into one. So then, you know, we can help through the process of, 
you know, how do you make an offer? How do you reference them? How should you pay them? How do you onboard them? And because the hiring, you know, once you get to the point of offering, you've kind of done most of the marathon. But then the second part of the Ironman starts because to actually make them successful, you've got to onboard them really well. You've got to set objectives and kind of invest time in them, do one-to-ones, things like that. So, you know, that's where we want to play. That's the space we want to play in helping people for long-term success. Because that, you know, from a purely selfish perspective, that's what keeps people coming back to us. Um, but also from my perspective, I'm, I like being helpful and friendly. Um, that is my entire strategy, actually, just to be helpful and friendly from a marketing perspective. And, and it, it sits really well with me. Um, I've had my time setting fire to thousands of dollars on Facebook ads that didn't work, stuff like that. So for me, just getting out there, being helpful and friendly and helping people. And that, you know, that kind of makes the, makes the world go round and, and keeps people coming back. I like that. That's cool. So it's not just a job board. It's um, a hybrid of an HR service and, and, a, and a network of, of uh, talent as well. And so I, that's awesome. And again, I was really excited to bring you on because I can't praise people from that region highly enough. And I, I, I love that you pointed out the cultural fit because I would, I would add to the list of things to be prepared for. Um, like you said, strong personalities, leaders that are going to push you and uh, be very quick to point out this is the one point that i that you made me think of if they see anything within their vision the work the structure around them that doesn't make sense they will point it out and bring it to you and suggest that you change it and so if you're not prepared for that kind of feedback you know you should you should think about that before you go um, to the region but i think for people that that want to grow and love constructive criticism, I don't think you could find better candidates. Yeah, definitely. I agree entirely. Noel, thanks so much for coming on. This is great. And I hope uh, I hope people that are ready to start hiring. Oh, you mentioned a free guide. Where mm. can people find that? Yeah, so if people head on over to jobrack.eu, uh, then under the resources section, we've got a how to hire remotely guide. Um, there's a ton of detail in there. It's very actionable. So it's literally, it's got links to the application forms that I use when I'm hiring. Um, every kind of step is bro absolutely broken out. That's in there. Um, so yeah, head on over to the resources section. Um, and if anyone wants any help or even just wants to have a kind of a chat about hiring from Eastern Europe, then just jobrack.eu. Um, and you can find your way around there, kind of book in a call with me and um, we have a kind of 15 minute chat and, um, and go from there. Awesome. I love it. Thanks for coming on, Noel. Hey, no worries, Chase. Great to chat. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you in the next one.